Sometimes some people say, well, we don't know what causes cancer. That's sort of a cop out because we actually do know a lot about what causes cancer. Cancer. It's a word that sends shivers down our spines. But what if I told you that most cases of cancer are not purely genetic? In fact, a huge part of it is within our control. Today, we'll break down the real causes of cancer and what you can do to prevent it backed by science and insights from Dr. Jason Fung. Let's dive in. Dr. Jason Fung is a well-known Canadian nephrologist, author and expert in metabolic health. While he is perhaps best known for his work on intermittent fasting and reversing type 2 diabetes, his ideas have also sparked discussions about how metabolic factors may influence cancer risk. Today, we're taking a closer look at some of those ideas. Sometimes some people say, well, we don't know what causes cancer. That's sort of a cop out because we actually do know a lot about what causes cancer. And these are things that uh, cause cancer are called, are called carcinogens. And the World Health Organization maintains a huge list of these carcinogens. Carcinogens are substances that have the potential to cause cancer by damaging DNA or disrupting cellular processes. They can be found in various sources such as tobacco smoke, industrial chemicals, radiation, and even certain food additives. Continuous exposure to carcinogens increases the risk of mutations that can lead to uncontrolled cell growth, forming tumors. Understanding and minimizing exposure to carcinogens is essential for cancer prevention. Number one, tobacco smoke. If you want to break it down into what causes cancer in uh, most people, you can look at the sort of, a uh, couple of studies have looked at the sort of percentage contribution of these carcinogens to, to uh, cancer. And the, the biggest one, of course, is tobacco smoke. So that's sort of by far and away the, the biggest contributor to cancer at around 35%. And these estimates were from 2015. So it, it's, it, it was higher before when more people are smoking, but as a contributor to a cancer, it, it's the biggest. Tobacco smoking is responsible for over 8 million deaths annually, with at least one in three cancer-related deaths linked to smoking. According to the World Health Organization, WHO, smoking contributes to at least 15 different types of cancer, including lung, throat, and bladder cancer. Tobacco smoke is widely recognized as the leading cause of cancer, particularly lung cancer, and is responsible for a significant number of cancer-related deaths. This harmful substance contains over 70 known carcinogens that damage DNA and disrupt cellular processes, paving the way for uncontrolled cell growth. Smoking not only increases the risk of lung cancer, but is also linked to cancers of the mouth, throat, esophagus, pancreas, and bladder. Additionally, secondhand smoke poses a serious risk to non-smokers, exposing them to the same hazardous chemicals and increasing their cancer risk. The prolonged exposure to tobacco smoke results in cumulative damage over time, making it one of the most dangerous substances we encounter. Quitting smoking at any age can drastically reduce cancer risk, and within 10 years of quitting, lung cancer risk drops by 50%. Cigarette smoke contains over 7,000 chemicals, 70 of which are known carcinogens. These damage DNA and weaken the body's natural defense mechanisms. Secondhand smoke is just as dangerous, causing 1.2 million deaths each year, even among non-smokers. Quitting smoking or avoiding tobacco smoke altogether can dramatically reduce your risk of developing cancer and improve overall health. Number 2. Diet Interestingly, the second biggest and almost as big is actually our diet. So it's a huge, huge part of what contributes to cancer in general and far outstrips of those two are way above any other causes of cancer so when you worry about things such as radiation or you know chemicals sunscreens and pesticides and stuff like that they do cause cancer but the contrib contribution in a whole population is very small diet is considered the second biggest contributor to cancer risk following tobacco smoke unhealthy eating habits including high consumption of processed foods, red meats, and refined sugars, can create an environment conducive to cancer development. Poor diet often leads to obesity, a well-known risk factor for various cancers, such as breast, colon, and pancreatic cancers. Moreover, diets lacking in essential nutrients, antioxidants, and fiber may weaken the body's natural defenses against cancerous cells. Consuming an abundance of unhealthy fats and sugars can lead to chronic inflammation and insulin resistance, further increasing cancer risk. 
So what's interesting about diet is that we, we, we know this from our studies, but what part of the diet actually contributes to cancer? And that's where things sort of bog down a lot. So initially in the 70s, people talked about fiber. So people thought about, oh, hey, well, you know, maybe if you eat a lot of fiber, what you're going to do is have a lot of big bowel movements and that's going to clean out your bowel and then you're not going to get cancer. Turns out that wasn't true. Then the next thought was, hey, maybe it's dietary fat. So if you remember the 80s and 90s, there's this huge movement against fat that, you know, all fat is bad for you. It caused uh, heart disease and all this sort of stuff, much of which has sort of been, you know, overturned at this point. But there's this thought, maybe it causes cancer too. Turns out that wasn't true up in there. And then people talked about vitamins. So maybe cancer is like a vitamin deficiency. So we did many, many studies, millions of dollars, decades of research, where we would randomize people to say one group that took a certain vitamin and one group that didn't and see if there's any difference in cancer. So we tested vitamin A, didn't work. Vitamin D, B, didn't work. Folic acid, didn't work. Vitamin C, didn't work. Vitamin D, didn't work. Vitamin E, didn't work. Selenium, didn't work. Uh, omega-3 fatty acids didn't work. So all of those supplements didn't actually make any difference to the incidence of cancer. Uh, and the, the, so we were sort of stuck at that point in the mid 2000s saying, oh, we know it's the diet, but what part of the diet? And that's when it became sort of more and more clear that this cancer is actually an obesity related disease. From 2003, we didn't even know, like when I went to medical school, Nobody thought obesity caused cancer. Really? It's as, almost as big as smoking. It's a huge, huge thing. Obesity is a significant risk factor for cancer due to its profound impact on the body's hormonal and inflammatory systems. Excess body fat produces higher levels of hormones like estrogen and insulin, which can stimulate cell proliferation and inhibit normal cell death, paving the way for mutations and tumor formation. Moreover, obesity leads to chronic low-grade inflammation, a state that damages tissues and alters immune responses, further increasing cancer susceptibility. Research has linked obesity to a higher risk of several cancers, including breast, colon, kidney, and pancreatic cancers. Metabolic imbalances caused by excess weight, such as insulin resistance and altered cytokine profiles, create a biological environment conducive to cancer development. So what happened, of course, is that in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, People didn't really think about it, but then we had this obesity epidemic, so it became a bigger and bigger problem. So uh, obesity in, in 2003, when they started to look at the studies, that was the first really definitive studies that said, hey, you know, obesity is actually a huge risk factor, as well as type 2 diabetes. And, and both of those conditions will actually increase your risk of certain types of cancer a lot. Mm. So it really depends on what type of cancer you're talking about. Like if you're talking lung cancer, obesity plays almost no role in it, right? That's smoking. Uh, or if you have asbestos, which causes me mesothelioma, which is a cancer of the lining of the lung, again, obesity plays no role. But things like breast cancer and colorectal cancer, which are sort of really important uh, cancers, they actually are obesity-related cancers. So that was the sort of big link. And uh, to this, you know, at this point, the World Health Organization considers 13 different types of cancer as obesity-related cancers which is huge. So therefore, if you know that, that's super powerful because if you can maintain a normal weight, you're going to reduce, just like stopping smoking, right? You're going to reduce your risk of these types of cancer. A lot of different things that go on, and that's what I spend the first half of the book talking about, is how the sort of uh, cancers develop. So it's not just about obesity, just like you can smoke forever and not get lung cancer, but it raises your risk. So smoking and diet are probably your biggest factors. And then there's a whole, there's like a hundred different uh, other risk factors for cancer. These are the other carcinogens that we talk about. But also things such as, you know, background radiation and sun exposure, you know, like if you get too much sun, for example. So there's all sorts of other things and genetics plays a role. But one of the big mistakes I think we made is that we focus so much on the genetics part of it, thinking that, well, this is sort of a random mutation that mm. causes cancer. Background radiation and sun exposure are environmental factors that can significantly increase cancer risk. Natural background radiation comes from cosmic rays, radon gas, and terrestrial sources, 
exposing us to low levels of ionizing radiation every day. Although these levels are typically low, cumulative exposure over time can damage DNA, leading to mutations that increase the risk of cancers such as leukemia and thyroid cancer. Similarly, sun exposure contributes primarily to skin cancer. The sun emits ultraviolet UV radiation, which penetrates the skin and causes direct DNA damage. Over time, repeated exposure to UV rays can overwhelm the skin's natural repair mechanisms, resulting in mutations that lead to melanoma, basal cell carcinoma, and squamous cell carcinoma. So the point about cancer is that cancer is like a seed. So if you have the genetics, you have the propensity to develop cancer. And this seed of cancer actually exists in all of our cells, and actually not just all our cells, but in all multicellular animals have that sort of seed of cancer. So what's important then is you can't do anything about the seed, but what you can do something about is the soil, which is that if you provide a fertile sort of soil for that seed to germinate, then you are going to increase your risk of developing this cancer. And cancer is not a rare disease. I mean, it affects like one in 10 of us, one in eight of us, something like that. So it's something that we really have to think about as we live longer because it is one of these really important things. While cancer is a multifactorial disease with many complex causes, the strategies we've discussed today provide a holistic approach to reducing your overall risk. Remember, small, consistent changes in your lifestyle can add up to big health benefits over time. Thanks for watching. We hope you found these insights helpful and that you're inspired to take positive steps toward better health. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with friends, and don't forget to subscribe to Be Optimal for more health and wellness tips.